Oh, Bishop, the new kid. First day. We'll take it easy on you. Just park the Lincoln Town cars. Back in 1981. Ford's Lincoln division revamped its lineup to have its largest full-size model be the town car, a rear-drive body on frame shared with the Ford LTD Crown Victoria. Although Ford had planned to eventually transition the town car to a smaller front-drive design, the town car's success, along with stabilized gas prices, convinced Ford to keep the town car as Lincoln's largest flagship model. This is where the theater critics sit. And this is where the car critics sit. However, by the mid-2000s, with SUVs becoming more popular, especially Lincoln's own Navigator, the town car, which was on the last ever rear-drive body-on-frame car platform, saw its sales drop considerably each year and finally canceled in 2011. This is the story of the Lincoln town car. This is my old car. The 1984 Lincoln town car. From where I sit, I gotta believe this is one tough act to follow. You are my number one guy. Although the first Lincoln to have its entire model name be Town Car first arrived in 1980 for the 1981 model year, the name Town Car wasn't new to Lincoln. In 1959 and 1960, the Continental Town Car was the highest luxury model you could get from Lincoln, with every possible option, including air conditioning as standard. With only 214 ever built, it is one of the rarest vehicles ever made by Ford Motor Company. The town car name came back for 1970 through 79, again as a top trim for the Continental. Available in two and four door models, the two doors were renamed Town Coupe, and all of them came standard with vinyl roofs. Starting in 1975, another classic 70s feature, oval opera windows, became standard on the four door models. Did you see that Lincoln pull up? But the very large sedans of the 70s kept losing horsepower to meet strict emission standards. What Lincoln? Which led to the introduction of the Panther platform for 1980. Although it would still look like a very large sedan today, at 219 inches, or over 18 feet long, the new Panther platform replaced Ford's former full-size platform that was over a foot longer. It also meant that Lincoln lost the title of largest sedan to Cadillac's Fleetwood. Go! Damn good. For 1980, the town car name was still a trim for the Continental, and as a result, it was still offered in both two- and four-door models. Starting in 1981, Lincoln consolidated the Continental and Continental town car models into just the town car but it was slotted below the Continental Mark VI. The two-door town car sold so poorly, at less than 5,000 for 1981, that the two-door was gone by 1982. With the four-door town car selling less than 28,000 for 1981, and expecting that gas prices would continue to rise, Ford started planning on the town car potentially being replaced by a smaller and more fuel-efficient front-wheel drive model within a few years. But then the unexpected happened. Fuel prices stabilized, and sales for the town car nearly tripled by 1984. By 1985, sales were nearly 120,000, and the town car was now considered the flagship for Lincoln. The black Cadillac, please. Right away, sir. By this point, Cadillacs DeVille and Fleetwood had switched to smaller front-wheel drive models, which were shared with Oldsmobile and Buick. Lincoln took advantage of GM's platform sharing with this 1985 ad that mocked the common look of the GM models. This my Cadillac? No, it's an Oldsmobile. I think. Lincoln kept the same engine and transmission during this entire generation, a 4.9 liter V8 with a 4-speed automatic, which only could produce 130 horsepower in 1981, but increased in power to 160 by 1986. You could even order your town car with a trailer hitch, which may sound odd now, but with a lack of sport utility options like we have today, towing a trailer with a full-size sedan was a common sight in the 80s. Inside, three-person front and rear bench seats were the only option. And although leather seats were an option, cloth seats were still appreciated back then, as they were often more plush and therefore more comfortable than leather. Up through 1984, you could still get an 8-track player and even a CB radio, but by 1985, the town car became the first Ford available with an in-dash CD player. And during this first generation, Lincoln offered several special editions of the town car, such as the Cartier Designer Edition and the Sail America Commemorative Edition. By the late 80s, the town car's square lines were looking more like a relic as compared to the rest of Ford, Mercury, and even the Lincoln lineup, as the Continental and Mark series cars were following more along the lines of the Taurus and Thunderbird by taking on Ford's new, more rounded look. Yet the design wasn't too old to not be considered for quite possibly the most prestigious role any car could obtain, that being the President's limousine. For George H.W. Bush's term starting in 1989, a 1989 town car was commissioned to replace the Cadillac Fleetwood used by President Reagan since 1983. Upon the start of Bill Clinton's term in 1993, he went back to a Cadillac Fleetwood, and Cadillac has maintained this role since then, 
making the Bush 41 term the last one to use a Ford for the presidential limo. Behind the scenes, as far back as 1985, Lincoln was working on a new version of the town car that was initially planned to more closely match Ford's new rounded style. But with sales at over 123,000 in 1989, Lincoln did not want to make too drastic of a change in the size or look of the car. For that reason, and to save on development costs, the new 1990 town car would stay with the rear drive, body on frame, Panther platform. This also was a benefit to the many town car buyers who converted them into limousines and hearses, as body on frame was easier to modify and easier to repair. Not only will it be an honor, I'll give you a rate. I'll see your rate and raise you. It even stayed with the same 4.9 liter V8 in its first year, as development delays pushed back its replacements by one year. A 4.6 liter modular V8 with single exhaust that was standard and a dual exhaust model was optional. Despite its lower displacement, the two variations of the 4.6 increased horsepower to 190 and 210 respectively. Lincoln Town Car, what a luxury car should be. Although the second gen town car had the same outside dimensions as the first gen and kept its upright front grille, the hard edges were gone to improve aerodynamics and wind noise. But even more notably missing was the vinyl top, which was a relic of the 70s that had been increasingly growing in unpopularity during the last few years. Well, it's a dog eat dog world, Sammy, and I'm wearing milk bone underwear. More cost cutting could be found on the interior, as much was shared with its platform mates, the Crown Victoria and Grand Marquis. In particular, the optional digital dashboard from the Mercury, becoming the standard dash for the town car. Although digital dashboards have been tried and ultimately disliked in many car models during the 1980s, the older buyers seem to like these features, like the digital speedometer. Even a cell phone integrated into the center armrest was an option. The new contemporary look even impressed Motor Trend magazine enough to name it their car of the year for 1990. As this was the days before SUVs had become so dominant among all vehicle sales, the new town car was a big hit for Lincoln, helping make 1990 the brand's highest sales year up to that point. Not surprisingly, Lincoln continued its tradition of special edition models. One of the most memorable was the Jack Nicholas edition, named after the then famous golfer, who also starred in multiple commercials for Lincoln. The trunk of the town car was big enough to hold several sets of golf clubs, and tying the advertising to golfing was a perfect match for the expected town car buyer. Cloth seats were still standard, but leather seats were an option. Anti-lock brakes were now available, but they were optional, not standard, as fleet buyers found them more expensive to maintain and preferred to avoid them. Sales hovered at just over 100,000 per year up until 1996, when sales dropped around 90,000 for that year. As Ford continued to push more rounded car designs in the second half of the 1990s, the town car would now finally also conform to the new look. Revealed in 1997 at the New York Auto Show, the third gen town car was a significant departure from the second gen and nearly unrecognizable when parked next to a first gen. Despite the rest of Ford's car platforms being unibody, the Panther platform retained its rear drive body on frame architecture, which not only helped support the Crown Victoria's police package for its durability and ease of repairs, but also continued to be a benefit for limo and hearse conversions. And whereas the Crown Victoria and Grand Marquis shared much their interior and exterior, or continued to make efforts to keep the town car looking different enough to distinguish the Lincoln from its lower priced siblings. The V8 remained at 4.6 liters but increased to 220 horsepower for dual exhaust models. Although three inches shorter than the outgoing model, it gained two inches in width and an inch in height, the latter making it the tallest Lincoln sedan in 40 years. Its new curved roofline also meant the loss of the rectangular opera windows, another relic that was long past its prime. Although many buyers still converted the town car into limousines, beginning in 2001, the town car L model was introduced that added six inches to the wheelbase. For the first few years of the third gen, Lincoln offered what they called the Signature Touring Package, essentially an improved handling package that was also available on the Ford and Mercury Panther platform models. This feature was dropped after 2003, I suspect because town car owners cared little about it. It's targeted at younger buyers or buyers still young at heart. The same year that the third gen town car debuted, Lincoln also launched the Navigator, its luxury SUV that shared the Ford Expedition platform. As the first automaker to try offering a full-size SUV under a luxury mark, it was a big risk for Lincoln at the time, but quickly proved to be the best move they ever could make. With three rows of seating and optional four-wheel drive. Why didn't you just have him park it in the lot? I didn't want it scratched. The Navigator offered everything the town car had, plus a lot more. Hey, how you doing? I'm looking for something a little... Not so tight in the shoulders. Although the town car sales rose slightly for the new 1998 model, sales dropped every year after that, as their customers migrated to the Navigator. 
left my car. Do you leave the light on after bedtime? Ford made significant changes to the chassis, suspension, and steering in 2003, and reworked the front fascia, and improvements to the engine to increase horsepower to the highest it would ultimately be, 239. There was only so much they could do with a platform that had been around for over 20 years. During the 2000s, the town car continued to be one of the best-selling full-size luxury sedans. Sorry. But much of those sales were driven by limo and chauffeur companies, and not as many private sales. Ford considering ending the town car along with the Crown Victoria and Grand Marquis in 2007, when they announced the closure of its sole assembly plant in Wixom, Michigan. But all three models got a reprieve when production was shifted to the St. Thomas plant in Ontario. Ironically, this move to Canada for assembly also marked the end of private sales of the town car in Canada, leaving only fleet and limo sales. Total sales for the town car dropped below 27,000 for 2007, around 15,000 for 2008, and around 11,000 for 2009. With the Crown Vic having dropped private sales after 2007, and the Mercury brand shut down in 2010, the town car would end up being the last Panther model sold for private sale and rolled out the assembly line on August 29, 2011. No celebration followed, as if Lincoln was more ready to move on to their next chapter. By this point, Lincoln had been transitioning most of its model names to be three letters that all started with MK, and the sedans being too small to fill the limo void made by the loss of the town car. Lincoln offered their MKT crossover to be available for limo and chauffeur use, although its popularity was far less than the town car once enjoyed. Considering the MKT was arguably one of the most unattractive models Lincoln ever had. In hindsight, that lack of interest isn't surprising. Like all automakers, Lincoln's sedan sales in the mid-2000s were consistently lower than crossovers and SUVs, but that didn't dissuade Lincoln from offering a new flagship sedan when they reintroduced the Continental in 2016 for the 2017 model year. Breaking from the MK naming tradition and hoping the legacy Continental name would better invoke the brand's luxury theme, the new Continental's best sales year was 2017, with around 12,000 sold for the U.S. and 10,000 more for China. Sales in China didn't go past 2018, and U.S. sales kept dropping each year after that, despite offering a special coach door edition that had rear suicide doors. With only around 5,000 sold for 2020, Lincoln canceled the Continental. At the time, it was their only remaining sedan, leaving Lincoln a crossover and SUV-only automaker. That followed Ford's plan for North America to no longer have any sedan models for sale. Although there is clearly not enough of a market today for any vehicle like the town car, it doesn't mean the town car no longer has any fans. The durability of its V8 is well known, with it being common for some models to last over 400,000 miles, surviving despite plenty of abuse. Sadly, their age makes them no longer eligible for rideshare apps like Uber or Lyft, but there are still independent drivers who rely on them today. They remember back to a time when if you said the words town car, it didn't necessarily mean that specific model. The term was once synonymous with any chauffeur luxury sedan, a market which Lincoln was once dominant, but will likely never see again. Maybe your eyesight isn't as good as it used to be. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, click the like button and subscribe to my channel. If you once owned a car from the 80s to mid 2000s that you rarely see today and would like it featured in a future episode, leave a reply in the comments or contact me at the email shown here. See you next time. Counselor. Eddie. I was hanging. Oh, a little to the left, my man. How about you?